If you're feeling stressed out and you got a big frown, listen to our show and slow the fuck down. Welcome to Slow the Fuck Down Show. I'm sensuality coach Casey Hall. And I'm drama healer Elizabeth Menzel. Season four is all about love. Each episode, we explore a different aspect of love with stories, science, skills, and songs so you can slow down and stress less. It's important to us that every episode is worth your time and that you leave feeling uplifted, inspired, and able to make positive changes in your life. On today's episode, slow the fuck down with a three-letter word that starts with S and ends with X. Sex. We're talking about sex. So get cozy, grab your favorite beverage, and soak in our soothing support. Welcome to season four! So winter is the internal time of year, and we're in rhythm with Mother Nature. We slowed way the F down this winter. We went into full sloth mode, and we hope that you've been giving yourself a big slowdown too. Normally, we take an even longer hiatus, but we're just too excited to start off our season of love with a bang. Sex. We're talking about sex. (laughs) So the act of sex has been weaponized, traumatized, suppressed, damned, exploited, and censored. So censored that we had to make an unnecessary long title of this episode because simply typing the word sex could get us banned from social media platforms. In this episode, we want to slow it down, shine a light, and talk about the healing, health, and humor aspects and illuminate the sacredness of sex. So if you're ready for some sexual healing, we dedicate today's show to you. In its simplest form, sex relates to the specific sexual acts that human beings and animals engage in, either in pairs, groups, or solo. To some, sex is a simple act of physical pleasure. For others, it's a way of communicating deep feeling and experiencing connection. And for some, sex is a spiritual and energetic experience. Here at Slow the F Down Show, we welcome all definitions of healthy expressions of sex. So Casey, how old were you when you found out about sex? What do you remember? I was in middle school And I first learned about sex in my CCD class. CCD stands for Confraternity of Christian Doctrine, and it's actually their early education for Catholics that was recommended by the Vatican. And I did not know that. I had to look it up. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, I mean, why would they tell you that? But maybe they did, and what kid's going to remember that anyway? (laughs) Right. I still have a a hard time saying it as an adult. But I remember being in CCD class, and I had a crush on this boy in my class, and we had just had our first kiss a couple weeks prior. And I remember the nun talking about sex, and she said that if we had sex prior to marriage, that we were going to hell. And I remember looking at the boy I had a crush on and being like, oh, damn, that's not good. <laughs> it was just like so <laughs> conflicting because I'm like, oh, here's this cute guy. We just had this romantic feeling. And now if we take it further, like we're both going to hell. Yeah, that's terrifying and shaming. Here you had this super pure experience of your first kiss. And then within a couple of weeks, the shame kibosh was put on you and fear around what would happen to you. Mine wasn't super much better. I mean, I know I read about sex in some way in Judy Bloom books. I'm sure any other Gen Xers can relate to that. I don't remember exactly, you know, how or what it was, but I know that they were pretty racy and that a lot of schools across America banned Judy Bloom books because of it. But I remember having the talk with my mom. I'm sure most of us remember the talk because it was probably one of the most embarrassing things that we had ever felt. I know it was for me. And it happened in a really kind of awful way. My mom and I were watching this uh, TV show called Beretta, and it was a cop show. And on it, a woman had just been raped. And that was the case they were trying to solve. At the commercial, my mom turned to me and said, do you know what rape is? And I said, yeah. And I felt like this pit in my stomach and super embarrassed. And my mom said, well, what is it? And I said, it's when a man forces a woman to take her clothes off and get naked. And she said, and then what? And I said, that's it. That's rape. And my mom said, well, then the man forces the woman to have sex with him, even though she doesn't want to. 
you know, there was this awkward pause. And then she said, do you know what sex is? And I didn't really. I remember being like so embarrassed and so sort of turned into myself and turtling and trying to make myself as small as possible. So my very first introduction to sex was through the lens of rape. I mean, how awful is that? I try to cut parents a lot of slack because I really believe that we do the best that we can. But to have that talk the first time, be on the heels of a topic of rape, that was the association that your mind made. Yeah, yeah. And, and no knock on my mom. I mean, hey, she really was doing the best she could with an awkward situation. And sadly, I'm not alone there. A lot of people are introduced to sex because of rape. Yeah, according to the National Sexual Violence Resource Center, 81% of women and 43% of men reported experiencing some form of sexual harassment or assault in their lifetime. Yeah, and over half of those sexual assaults are by someone that the person knows. And slow down fans, we know that this is a very tender topic for a lot of you. And it is a very tender topic for Elizabeth and I that we have a ton of compassion and empathy for. And we're bringing it up because part of the reason why it is so pervasive is because it's been kept in the shadows. It's because people don't talk about it. Yeah, it's often too scary or too dangerous to bring up. And we are going to focus this episode on the health, the healing, the light, the sacred, the fun. But we can't contribute to the silence by not also bringing in this darker side and just wrapping our hearts around you and letting you know that we know how fraught with challenges the topic of sex can be. So if you need support with sexual violence, you can Google rape support near me, sexual violence support near me, and local resources and safe houses will pop up for you. Or you can text HOME, H-O-M-E, to 741741 and get immediate help from the crisistextline.org. That's the crisistextline.org. And if you've got some sexual trauma that you want high quality care in dealing with, go to traumahealing.org. That's traumahealing.org and find yourself a somatic experiencing therapist that specializes in helping you recover from sexual violence. This is how I've gotten help. You can heal, you can feel better, and you do not have to go through this time alone. Luckily, my first time having sex was way better than my first time learning about sex. I had been with my boyfriend for nine months. We had set the date for her having intercourse months in advance. I mean, what teenager does that? And two weeks before the first time sex date, we took two buses uh, through the city and went to a health clinic and had like a 90 minute conversation and private class with a nurse practitioner there who taught us about all the different methods of birth control and fitted me for a diaphragm and gave us a bunch of condoms and taught us how to use them. And it was awesome. We were so safe and proactive and pragmatic <laughs> about our approach to sex, which, uh, I've never heard of any girlfriends that have done that same thing, but wow, I, I highly recommend it. I am so appreciating the fact that we have a podcast right now because that is one of the most woke first time sex stories I've ever heard. <laughs> and and this was before it was kind of cool to be woke like that too. And I think that's amazing. Obviously, I have watched plenty of teen movies over the years and teen TV shows and know that there's all this pressure for teens to have sex. And that was also the opposite of my experience as a teenager. I was in a group of really woke kids and we were all super mutually supportive. And I joined that group in junior high, but they had been together since grade school. They were brought up together. They're still all friends. I went to a party at their house before I left LA. We're all in our 50s now. So there wasn't any peer pressure 
to have sex. I know that that is not the typical story either. I'm so glad that you had that supportive group. That sounds like a, a truly rare and tight knit group if they're still close. And I do see a lot of parents consciously raising their kids to be sex positive. And so that goes out to their peer groups and they are educated well and they are taught consent. Yeah. And I think we're going in a really good direction. I grew up with the pressure to have sex. I remember being in high high school and I decided with my long-term middle school, high school boyfriend that I didn't want to have sex and he was okay with it. Everyone else could not believe that we were together for so long and not having sex. Like he got pressure all the time. I got pressure more so it was on him. And then I remember this strange thing happening where somehow our principals found out that we weren't having sex. And I remember being called into the principal's office and it's like, Casey, Hall, would you please come to the principal's office? And I'm like, oh crap, like I'm in trouble. And I remember getting in there and they were like, hey, would you mind talking about abstinence to the ninth and 10th grade health classes? And I was like, what? I wish my, you know, then 15 year old brain could have asked some clarifying questions. <laughs> First off, what do you know about me? Why, you know, all, all this kind of stuff, because I was your all American good girl. I was just like, okay. And I remember going to these health classes with these ninth and 10th graders that I was like on active sports teams with in new and just standing up there and being like, yeah, so uh, my boyfriend and I have been together for a while and we don't have sex. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> that, that was the extent of your speech. <laughs> so yeah, and I, I remember at the time that decision feeling genuinely like aligned to what I to what I wanted. I loved foreplay. I just didn't want to have sex. And so I didn't have a problem sharing that. I just didn't understand why it was so important. What a weird situation to put a teenager in. <laughs> You're like doing your their dirty work for them. <laughs> and then, you know, fast forward to my mid 20s and I'm teaching sex ed in high school and fast forward to right now in this moment. And I am a sensuality coach empowering people to own their sensuality and however that looks for them. Yeah. What a journey you've been on <laughs> right? from reluctant abstinency teacher to sex positive sensual and sexual and love teacher <laughs> that's a big journey you've been on girl right. <laughs> oh life is so weird so there was a 2016 study that found that 85 percent of female participants said they masturbated at some point in their lives with women starting at an average between 13 and 14 years old and no surprise 98.9 .9 percent of male participants started masturbating around 12 or 13 years old but in the 80s only 11 percent of female participants said that they had masturbated at some point in their lives so that is a big huge difference between 11 percent and 85 percent so yes there has been a lot of sexual awakening over the years a lot more sex positivity than there used to be a lot more healthy conversations around sex than ever before I think people's first experience with consensual sex is touching themselves. I remember reading an article, I think it was put out by Johnson & Johnson, and it was all about how healthy it is to masturbate. And I was like, oh, uh, I don't do that. I better learn how to do that. So <laughs> I remember trying to touch myself and I couldn't even do it because it made me want to throw up. Mm -hmm. And I honestly spent months trying to make myself masturbate. And luckily, I finally got it right. But <laughs> it was a real journey in discovering my own body through a lot of resistance, shame, awkwardness. But I think it was a really important thing for me to do. And I did that two years after I had had sex for the first time with someone else. So I kind of went about it really backwards and was late to that particular party. <laughs> Although it's a party for one. <laughs> uh, Liz, party for one. <laughs> Liz, party in your pants for one. <laughs> Liz, party in your pants for one.
Yeah, I mean, normally that's not something I'm going to bring up, but I really want people to hear that in case they feel the same way, in case they feel weird about touching their own bodies and have a lot of embarrassment around that. I feel you. You're not alone. Yeah. And, you know, you, you mentioned actually feeling nauseous at the idea of even touching yourself. I've experienced it and I continue to hear it. I remember hearing people calling their penis or their vagina or anything in the genitals, no-no spots. Yeah. Or your naughty bits. Mm -hmm. Part of it is you're trying to be cutesy about it, but what you're actually saying is that there's something inherently wrong with this part of you. And that sticks, you know, that sticks in the mind, that sticks in the body. And as we know, trauma gets stuck in the body. I remember watching a mother one time and their son I want to say he was maybe like four-ish. And their son stuck his hands in his pants sitting there while we were talking. And she looked over at him and was like, oh, ew, that's disgusting. Don't ever touch yourself there. Get your hand out of the pants. And just started like berating this kid. And I remember sitting there. And of course, I'm not going to step in and tell a mother how to raise her child. <laughs> that's, not my, that's not my job. But I remember sitting there and being like, wow, the work that I do as an adult, that kind of modeling early on that touching yourself is wrong and that you're actually being punished for it. And, and I remember people laughing around it almost like, oh, ha ha. And he was so confused because in his little four-year-old brain, he's like, cool, penis, cool toy. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. You know, baby self-pleasure in utero, it is one of the most natural things that we can do. Now, of course, you have to have your limit in your boundaries. You're in public. There's a time and a place for it. You have to teach that. But my point is, is those are those subtle things of even what you name your genitals. I say we just call it its anatomical name, your penis and your vulva. There are already existing names for it. That's my soapbox. And Elizabeth mentioned that we'd come a long way in terms of sex positivity. And there is a resource called omgyes.com. This is a guide for singles or couples to go to and learn all things masturbation. They have special names for different skills and tactics. So if you are someone who found yourself in the situation like Elizabeth was in, where you're wanting to learn how to self-pleasure better or how to pleasure your partner, go to omgs.com and check it out. Awesome. So you know what else is really interesting with me about the, the whole societal pressure thing? Didn't have it in high school like most people do, but I remember being in my 20s. Now, I don't remember anyone specific telling me this, but the message that I internalized from the zeitgeist was that I should be extremely sexually explorative and free and polyamorous and that if I wasn't, there was something wrong with me and that it's just sex and just go for it and just do it. And so I shoved my own truth down way down deep inside because my deep dark secret was that I just wanted to be monogamous <laughs> and have really sacred sex with one person. But that's not how I lived. <laughs> how I lived was not promiscuous. That was never my thing, but it was a lot of different sexually adventurous situations that I would get myself into. There is barely anything that I have not done or tried. I mean, you can do that from a really healthy place. I'm owning, like I kind of forced myself into these situations and it took me until my uh, late 20s to get really honest with myself and just be like, I just want to settle down and be married and be with one person. <laughs> I feel like I've done a lot of things late or in a reverse. <laughs> I think part of what helped me admit to myself that I wanted to be more monogamous was that I ended up with an STI from all of my sexual freedom. And so I also just wanted to be safer. On Healthline, it says as many as one in two Americans have oral herpes, and it's estimated that one in eight Americans ages 14 to 49 years old have genital herpes. Almost every single person I've ever talked to has some kind of herpes. I think it's just way more common and people don't admit it. They don't talk about it. It's not recorded. And unfortunately, just like flea bites and mosquito bites, women are almost twice as likely to contract HSV2 than men are. Thank you for presencing that and normalizing it because again, when you don't talk about something, you give it more power. 
Right. And you can be more likely to be a victim of it. Yeah. STIs have a profound impact on personal, sexual, and reproductive health worldwide. More than 1 million STIs are acquired every day. In fact, nearly all sexually active people will have HPV at least once in their lives. Bummer. Bummer. But let's talk about it so that we can be safe. In 2020, the World Health Organization estimated 374 million new infections of one of the top four STIs, chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, and trichomoniasis. And trichomoniasis. <laughs> Try to say that three times quick. STIs suck. Boo. Boo. Yeah, they do. Ugh, and you know, I thought it could never happen to me. Oh, we think we're so invincible until dun dun dun. <laughs> oh, sex capades. It's so hard and so embarrassing to want to have sex with someone, but have to tell them that you have herpes. And it occurred to me, oh my God, if I can't talk about sex with this person, I probably shouldn't be having sex with this person. Exactly that it was easier to do the act of sex than to talk about the act of sex with someone is kind of flabbergasting and pretty normal in our culture. And I know that even having the conversation around, have you been tested for STIs before you're intimate with someone is often skip or can be just super scary? Well, I'd say that not having that conversation with someone before you have sex with them is having sex without full consent. Because if that person doesn't know that you have an STI and you go ahead and have sex with them, that is not fully consensual sex. So as embarrassing as it might be, I urge urge you to have the conversation so that a full consent is had by both of you and you're empowering them to admit that they probably have an STI too and as adults you get to decide how you both want to keep yourselves safe consent and having those open honest conversations up front is something that i've seen the lgbtqia communities rock at in the past couple years for numerous reasons if it's non-heteronormative sex to begin with then that conversation more times than not has to be had in terms of what you're comfortable with what you're not comfortable with and a lot of times goes the STI conversation and other questions that encourage feeling comfortable before you engage in the act often occur so i think in that way the LGBTQIA community really sets an amazing example. Big thanks to our queer brothers and sisters. I remember a time when I shared with my partner about having an STI and we agreed to use condoms. It wasn't even active at the time. It was completely in remission, but still had the conversation, wanted to be safe. We were about to have sex, grabs the condom. I can hear him open it. He's fumbling in the dark with it. We're having sex. And then he says, oh, I guess I should put the condom on now, huh? I felt like I had been punched in the gut and I went kind of just numb and quiet at the time. I remember feeling furious, but there's the flight, fight, freeze, faint response of stress. And I just went into that freeze response and kind of shut down. And it was so super traumatizing because that trust was broken between us. Soon after, I developed a yeast infection that lasted a year, people. A year of hell. I went to doctors in two different countries. I took every medication. I did everything I could to try to heal that. But I stayed with that guy. <laughs> Our sex life deteriorated. I didn't want him to touch me. I was always scared of and nervous about him after that. During that same time, I had become a Louise Hay teacher, and she talks about candida and yeast infections being about abandoning your own power, being angry about a decision. And in a way, the yeast infection was also doing something I couldn't do for myself, which was it was keeping someone who felt unsafe for me away from me. It was saying no for me because I could not say no for myself. I'm so glad that you shared that. And I'm sorry that you had to deal with a yeast infection that went on for a year because that's just 
awful. You are at least the 30th woman that has shared a very similar story where they have been in partnership with someone, something happened, that trauma in your situation, the trust was broken, and then they developed a yeast infection, they developed BV, bacterial vaginosis, they developed a UTI, and then could not be physical with their partner as a result. And it just went on and on and on until either the issue was resolved or they split with that partner and then it went away. So much of the work that Elizabeth and I do take people from their heads into their bodies and really start to listen to the messages that our bodies are always, always giving us. And our genitals are no exception to that role. According to Norwegian doctor, psychiatrist, and clinical sexologist Hakan Ars, your sympathetic nervous system triggers the fight, flight, freeze, and faint response. You experience an increase in heart rate, your palms sweat, you want to go faster and speed ahead. This is also known as your accelerator mode. Your parasympathetic nervous system puts on the brakes and lets you rest or digest or feed and breed. And when your accelerator has been in overdrive for a long period of time, your body will actually begin to produce more cortisol, AKA the stress hormone, thus producing less testosterone. Most people with long lasting stress symptoms experience a decrease in sex drive. How many of you, gosh, I know I can, but how many of you slow down fans can relate to just being so stressed out and then having your partner want to be intimate and you're like, oh my gosh, I can't. It is inaccessible for me to even fathom being turned on right now because I'm so stressed. Yeah, I can totally relate to being too stressed out for sex. Because of the nonlinear movement method and having trauma therapy, I've been handling my stress much better. I don't have long-term stress issues anymore. My PTSD symptoms are minimized and I'm able to experience that deeply connected, healthy, loving, sacred sexual relationship that I wanted since the very beginning. Beginning. I'm still a little uncomfortable talking about sex with my partner. I can talk about it with my clients and my girlfriends all day, but <laughs> talking about it with my partner, I've gotten way better at over the years, but there's, you know, I still have to push myself forward to have these conversations. I still get red in the cheeks, but I do it now. And it's been this real journey of feeling safe, of opening my heart and opening my sensuality and my sexuality with another and uniting my loving heart with my saucy, primal sexual energy and letting them both be there at the same time. And that safety that you've cultivated for years and years and years is what allows them to both be there at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, it really does. You know, my latest journey inside my own body has been with menopause and it's really common to have pain during intercourse and menopause. And when that first started happening, I felt embarrassed about it and sort of my old reaction of just sort of clamping down and staying quiet about it and kind of just getting through it happened a few times. And then I was like, no, wait, my commitment to being fully consensual and truly uniting with my partner helped me to overcome my own embarrassment and bring up to him that I was experiencing pain and discomfort. And then, you know, we could work on it together. And I got to shift into being more playful and present during sexual intercourse and realizing that I had to keep, you know, changing positions and trying new things and let's try this way and let's put our legs this way, and let's go this way. And it became more lighthearted and more co-creative. Like it brought us even closer. I think that's the gift that healthy sacred sex gives to us is that ability to keep it fresh and present and alive with our partner because it's so common especially in long-term partnerships to fall into ruts 
And if you have pain on intercourse and are committed to keeping united and having healthy sexuality, it does not let you fall into a rut. <laughs> yeah. And I loved how you just described that. I hear that it shifted from relationship to divine union. And for me, there's a sacredness to union. There's you, the other person, and then the entity that is your union. And when you're able to approach sex with kind of all, all three of those components, it's like you're able to access this deep, energetic, kind of like new world that uh, of, of exploration when it comes to sex and your relationship. Slow down fans. In our episode about intimacy, we talk about this. I highly recommend you listen to that episode. It's awesome. And you know, we've talked a lot about sex, but not so much about sexiness. Hey, Casey, in your professional opinion, what is the difference between sexiness and sensualness? And where are they similar? For me, having a healthy sensuality means being connected to my senses, to the messages my body is constantly giving me, and understanding how this connection plays a crucial role in my relationship with myself and others. Sexiness is just a small piece of the sensuality pie. For me, sexiness is how I show up in intimacy, how I move, what I wear, what I say the actions and thoughts that I have that create the polarity or the tension between me and my partner. That's sexiness. I know for a long time, I never felt sexy. Putting on a skin tight, strappy black dress or lingerie does not make me feel sexy. But when I'm really deeply in touch with my body, with my bodily sensations, with scent, with a candlelit atmosphere, seeing beautiful things. I'm in touch with my sensual nature and I may not feel sexy when I'm in touch with my sensual nature, but I can't feel sexy unless I'm in touch with my sensual nature. So I can feel sensual in soft, cuddly pajamas and get into a sexy mood from that place. And I I can put on a piece of lingerie and either feel sexy or not feel sexy because it's all about my connection with myself. Oh, I love that. So sensuality is like the necessary foreplay that you need in order to tap into sexiness. For me, absolutely. I love that. I've felt and I hear a lot of my clients say they feel disconnected from their sexiness. And it's because a lot of what we need to connect, that sense of safety, that sense of presence, that sense of aliveness and being in our body isn't present before sex. And so it feels like you're just jumping too quickly into something that is deeply intimate sensuality, I mean, if you Google it, or if you look it up on Pinterest, it immediately shows sexiness, sexy images. That disconnect you just mentioned, I think is really common for a lot of people. If there has to be an order to it, for me, the order is sensuality, deeply connected to myself. And now I have the presence and the ability to feel my innate sexiness and then bring that to my partner or to myself. I love it. And I love that question too, because you're making me realize if I had to use one word to describe sensuality for myself, it's connection. When I wake up in the morning, I open my eyes and the first thing I do is feel my body in the sheets and I'm like, oh, it's morning. Oh, I'm here. Okay. And then I will run my fingers over my arm and start to wake up my body and be like, ah, oh, Oh, we're waking up. And then I get up and I make myself a cup of tea, connect with the warmth, connect with the sensations, connect with the lemon and, and drink it. And all the while I'm slowly using my senses to connect more and more with my body. And the last part of my morning routine is going outside and putting my bare feet on the earth and literally connecting with the earth. And then I'm connected to the elements. I'm connected to mother nature. And, and all the while I'm feeling the temperature of whatever the ground is beneath my feet. I'm feeling the wind on my face. I'm feeling the heat of the sun on my face. I'm taking in all of the scents and sights around me. And so it's all connection and none of that is sexual. All of that is sensual. But when I start my day from that place, as you said, the ability to tap in to my sexuality is much easier in an inflow state. 
Thank you so much for bringing nature into that equation. As soon as you said it, I was like, oh yeah, duh, of course, because getting out into nature, getting your feet on the earth is such a great helper to tap you into your sensual self for you it's tea in the morning and for me it's coffee in the morning and i know so many people can relate to that they have a truly deep relationship with their morning coffee or their morning tea and it's a very sensual experience i love every step of that process i love opening the container and smelling the beans grinding the beans like every part of it is a sensory experience for me Defining your sensuality for yourself and the way you approach sex can be a journey full of ups and downs for all of us. No pun intended. Our hope is that you learn something today that feels supportive to you. We know there is so much more we have to share about sex. Yeah, obviously the topic of sex is way too huge for just one podcast episode. And we are really going to be taking a deep dive into love, into sex, in our love love another group program that starts in spring. You'll learn how to overcome past relationship issues, reignite the spark with your partner, or manifest the love of your life in our trauma-informed somatic and neural-based virtual group program for singled, partnered, queer women. You're all welcome. So you can go to the happywomanacademy.com and click on the red button that says the love school and you'll learn all about it. So if that lights you up inside and you feel like, yes, this is exactly what I need, we really invite you to check out the Love School and the Love Another program. And if you register early, you will get a free ticket to our upcoming Manifest Love virtual retreat. That's on March 12th. You can find out about that on the happywomanacademy.com too. And we're actually going to give you a slowdown skill to help you right after a word from our sponsor. Hey, slowdown fans. It's me, Mother Nature. Of course I celebrate sex. It's part of nature, baby. Sex is alive in every part of me, and it's part of the divine party that not only keeps life going, but also makes it fun and pleasure-filled. Thank you, Mother Nature. And now for your slowdown skills. This skill will help you slow down, apply your break, and take some of the stress off of sex. Set aside the goal of orgasm when you have sex and see what happens. Oftentimes, movies portray sex as two people get home and with under 30 seconds to a minute, they're having penetrative sex and both of them have climaxed. And it really sets this tone that sex is quick and that the only end goal is orgasm and what this does is it puts a ton of pressure on both partners the person giving the pleasure feels like they have to perform and they have to help their partner reach this goal or the person receiving the pleasure feels like they have to have an orgasm otherwise their partner is going to feel let down it's like going to a four course meal because you hear that this place has amazing cheesecake and then completely bowling through and chugging your drink and eating everything super quick just to get to the dessert. And while dessert is amazing and it can also be delicious, when we're only focused on the end result of something, we miss all of the pleasure and newness and fun and slowness of everything that came before it. And sexual science fun fact, It takes between 20 and 40 minutes on average for female erectile tissue to become engorged and aroused. Remember that the next time you're watching a 30 second sex scene. So go ahead and set aside the goal of orgasm next time you go to have sex and see what happens. Hey Casey. What was your favorite part of today's show? I really enjoyed the title of this episode and your genius in creating it (laughs) because of censorship. We can only say sex on our podcasts and in certain spaces, but the fact that you came up with the three letter word that starts with S and ends with X just made it so much more fun. Elizabeth, what was your favorite part of today's show? Um, I like the science fun fact about 
female erectile tissue because I always thought that I was just way too slow. And so you've really helped me and thousands of women breathe a sigh of relief that we are actually within the normal range. I'm so happy to hear that. And that is why we slow down at Slow the F Down Show because slowing down makes better sex. I mean, slowing down for sex is a good enough reason in itself, but we just keep coming up with more and more reasons for you to slow down, people. <laughs> On our next episode, slow the fuck down with manifesting love. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Thank you for listening and enjoy your slowdown. If you love our show, become a patron. You'll get tons of goodies. Go to patreon.com slash slow the F down show and pick the tier that feels best to you. Thank you so much for your love and support. If you're feeling stressed out and you got a big frown, listen to our show and slow the fuck down.